Hello friends, how is it going? I'm Mario Thurger and today I'm here to briefly give you a certain idea concerning the goddesses of Viking Age Scandinavia. Mostly to be aware, historically speaking, of the main goddesses of this period in Scandinavian history, because in neo-pagan currents concerning Nordic subjects, uh, there's often the tendency to present a long list of feminine entities as goddesses, and most of which were not considered goddesses in pre-Christian Scandinavia, or at least a great quantity of female names in written sources are usually literary and or poetic embellishments or to convey a particular message, and only a few are actual goddesses, or were considered actual goddesses, with clear evidences to their worship and the, the cults around them. Well, we shall see that, actually. <laughs> um, it's like, for instance, in the case of the Vanir deities, uh, which nowadays there's been a couple of more esoteric content, making a long list of Vanir deities, uh, most of which feminine. However, as far as we are able to know, uh, there were only three deities considered to be of the Vanir. This doesn't mean that nowadays we cannot turn a specific figure into a goddess and present some form of devotion and a spiritual end or religious behavior towards a specific figure we may come to understand as a goddess in our own modern pagan or animistic life. I'm simply here to point out the historical reality of the Old Norse goddesses as we know it so far. <laughs> Uh, which were, indeed, the main goddesses of the Viking period. That's what this video is about, or I will try to pass on this message. I'm here to briefly present the information we know about their cults. How were their cults? Were there temples specifically dedicated to the goddesses and their worship? Uh, were there priestesses of these goddesses? So, let's start this. Um, actually... Uh, before we really start this, I just want to dedicate this video to the women that have been very important in my life and I could name quite a few that one way or another have given me good advice, support, friendship, love and hope. But there was one, however, someone that had come more recently in my life this year, whom I deeply love still and will always love. I've actually recorded this video before, I said her name out loud, I've made a whole speech in this video for her. So much I have said, you would have probably vomited how corny <laughs> I was. But I see myself more as someone quite romantic. <laughs> anyway, this video is also, and still is, dedicated to her. But the gods are cruel, so everything I've said you will never know because I had to edit this part out, because it no longer makes sense at this point. My love for her is still here, but unfortunately things were not meant to be between us, and so every word I swallow in silence and no one will ever hear such words except me, playing on a loop inside my head. Very special woman, uh, and neither of us regret a thing. It was just not meant to be, despite the love we bear for each other. Let's leave it at that. I'm sure you weren't there to listen to some random guy's lamentations on the internet. There's actually channels just for that, and this isn't one of them. My dear friends, let's get started, please. There is a great deal of imagination and modern fantasy when it comes to the deities of various paganisms, and it is no exception when it comes to the Norse goddesses. Uh, this is also largely due to the lack of information on these topics in sources at the time from that period. And um, uh, many of them not only did not survive, but we are talking about sources that have changed quite a lot through time, with a lot of omissions, deliberate changes, adding new concepts and elements, changes in mentality and religion, and even changes in perceptions, the way in which politics and economy changes the mentalities and the needs of communities and this also leads to changes in the spiritual field especially in mythology that in populations where oral tradition was mostly the 
means of preserving knowledge, mythology had a fundamental role in preserving important cultural aspects. And naturally, nowadays, there's a lot of inventions, a lot of content that isn't found anywhere else except in people's ability to be quite imaginative. I'm not talking about uh, UPG, unverified personal gnosis, but uh, inventions more in the field of trying to pass on information as being the truth and the only truth possible for one's own benefit in some way. Uh, that's a lot of what's been happening. So I'm going to repeat something I've said in other videos and of course I apologize to those who have already heard me saying this before, but there are uh, quite a few uh, new people on this channel and there's always someone whose first video they watch from my channel could very well be this one. So bear it with me because I think it's, it's always important to reflect on this. Uh, it is important to reflect that mythology is not religion. Mythology is not religion, right? There are differences between mythology, between rite or ritual and between cult. Mythology is a narrative which certainly preserves various cultural aspects and has in itself the experiences of populations, morals, values, perceptions of the world, explanations about life and ways of life and also about nature itself and how human beings uh, somewhat fit into all of this. Mythology also presents stories, adventures, popular traditions. Mythology is a narrative. It is not the presentation of a religion. It is not the spiritual or religious conduct. It is not the ritual. It is not the cult that is given to some deity. This is important to say because many people today take the gods they want to worship from mythology alone and many names that appear in there, which not even mythology itself deals with, with these names as being divinities, are turned into deities by modern groups. And this leads to many misconceptions. A good example of this is Loki. We return to Loki. Uh, Loki was not a deity, uh, was not a god. And this is important to understand for those who want to somehow include Loki in, in their spiritualities, but also important from an academic perspective to understand the perception of these populations and why Loki even appears and what was its role, if any. Loki presents itself as the trickster spirit, a much more animistic concept that, that helps us to really understand its role in the folk spiritual perception of the time. Uh, he was not a worshipped divinity, he was not part of the religiosity of the time, but that does not mean that he was not important, since Loki, we know, was a trickster spirit, also connected to the home and the hearth, a spirit of the air and of summer, the semi-shamanic cultural hero. By understanding this about Loki, we modern pagans, as well as scholars and both, uh, we can better understand the role of these types of spirits and better direct our spirituality and our studies towards something that go, goes much, much further and much more in line into the importance and role uh, and, and attributes of these spirits. And then we have the rite or the ritual, the cult itself, which is surprisingly often mistaken, mistaken sorry, with mythology. Cult, worship, is the devotion itself, and the rite is the action itself, be it prayer, lighting a candle, or some other kind of pragmatic action aimed at providing devotion, worshipping an entity within a religiosity or spirituality, or some form of behavior towards an entity that aims to cause action doesn't necessarily has to be always a form of veneration, but also to avert some disaster that may come from that deity, or that deity controls a specific power, even a natural force, and a ritual may be conducted to focus, focus the, the intention towards that specific power that deity controls. The ritual is the way the person worships, gives thanks, tried to avoid something, etc. These forms of worship do not appear in mythology. They do not appear in mythology. They may appear in some chronicles, sagas, stories, 
mainly the way of worship of populations that are not within the social and private space of the elites are not or were not registered. Not least because within the panorama of traditional folk beliefs, uh, there is a, a greater personification of the cult and the ways in which worship is performed. The, the form of ritual, it varies a lot. So, okay, mythology is different from the right and different from the cult. Also worth mentioning um, that there's been quite the tendency to deal with the Addas, as religious texts, namely speaking of the prose Adda and the, the compilation of poems called the Poetic Adda, they mostly deal with myths. Therefore, they are not religious texts. They are not sacred scriptures. I've done a video explaining all of this in more detail. If you want and if you have the time, please check it. And certainly many people may say that something can be sacred if it has a sacred connotation to them. Surely, but that's not what we are dealing with here. We are talking about literary sources of the period and they were not, they were not seen as sacred texts back then. If modern people want to deal with them as sacred scriptures nowadays, that's up to them. But passing them as historical sacred scriptures to the modern public as if they were seen and understood as sacred texts and scriptures at the time, that's an error and leads to several misconceptions that obviously present, prevents an understanding of the mentalities of the time as well as the, the actual perception of sacredness and of the divine. The Addas were not considered sacred texts. Even if people say everything can be sacred, well, if everything is sacred, then nothing is. There's no such thing as the sacred book of the Addas, as I've seen some mention it. The Addas are literary works that bring a set of poems, or uh, in the case of Snorri's Edda, that presents a work in prose with didactic purposes, or for didactic purposes, for professional poets, and then present these mythological narratives. The exploits of the gods, adventures, mythical beings, and so on and so forth. They are literary products, compilations of mythological narratives, which come to us as manuscripts uh, that we can study for a better understanding of Norse mythology, not religion. These literary works do not show how the rites were performed. They do not show the ritual or the cult. We cannot forget that these compilations of myths were made to please an elite, a very specific elite, specifically a warrior elite, a military elite. The vast majority of people who were part of this military elite were men, which is why all these mythological narratives will focus on and bring out much more a patriarchal and masculine reference. We are dealing with sources that were created much more from a male point of view and from a perspective of life, from the point of view of a patriarchal and military elite, and to extol that same elite. For this very reason, unfortunately, the goddesses do not have much space in these narratives, nor a great visibility. And this is easily detected since most narratives really have a great focus on male gods. Not only in military, warlike and sovereignty terms, but also even in matters of fertility and virility. Hence, what we can really know about goddesses is from the point of view or where um, goddesses in pre-Christian Viking Age society in Scandinavia occupied little space in religiosity and played a minor role in the ancient Germanic world. Note that we are talking about the evidences we have, both literary and archaeological ones, so far. It is a society that will focus much more on a patriarchal power. This does not mean, please, this, this, this does not mean that the goddesses were not important and were not worshipped by other social strata, right? Unfortunately, the evidences appear largely within a social environment of a patriarchal elite. So it is very difficult to understand the true importance of goddesses and their roles in these societies and how many goddesses there were. In Viking Age Scandinavia, 
which will inherit a good portion of ancient Germanic cultures, uh, giving way to new goddesses and also a, a syncretism of female divinities, there are at least two goddesses that have more relevance in Scandinavia at the end of the Iron Age. They are Frigg, Frigga, and Freya. It is these goddesses who appear in some adventures, some narratives in Norse mythology. Very li little mythological narrative content in relation to these goddesses compared to the amount of narratives of male deities. Frigg, Frigga, is a direct heritage of the ancient Germanic world, most likely introduced into Scandinavia during the period of migrations. Freya, on the other hand, is a more recent goddess uh, in the history of pre-Christian Scandinavia. Naturally, these goddesses come down like other deities, would absorb the att attributes of other older deities. However, the names of these goddesses appear later and it, it is a much later cult that develops around the Viking society, a society of the Great Hulls, a society controlled by the nobility. So these goddesses will reflect late Iron Age Scandinavian society in the north. The name Freya itself means the lady, reflecting a position of sovereignty alongside the lord. Unfortunately, uh, there is no evidence of how the rituals, the cults, were made to these goddesses. At most, there are some glimpses of, uh, of certain behaviors, sometimes in folklore, that still retain some traces of practices that are later mixed with other religious figures from later times. We have, for example, in folklore, the act of leaving milk or pouring milk in a, in a crop field for Freya's cats pleasing her magical animals so that Freya blesses the crops. And surely the, the practice of offering a food substance to the very soil where cereals are planted is a very common practice for various goddesses. But we have no evidences of how their cults were made. Who worshipped them? And if there really were spaces, structures to worship the goddesses? However, there's something important that has been uh, overlooked for quite some time. Theophoric names. Uh, in this case, not of people, but a, a toponym, a place name. But in this case, theophoric in nature, bearing the name of a deity. We do find a couple of place names derived from deities, which present the once importance of, uh, of, of a certain cult towards a deity in that space to the point of naming it after that deity. Of course, uh, for the reasons previously stated, these place names are more abundant in relation to male gods than goddesses. But there are a few. This precisely shows a lesser cult of goddesses than of gods uh, throughout the landscape. When there is very little worship towards something, it is even more difficult for rituals to survive. But, however, goddesses were much more worshipped, it seems, in the rural world, of course. Since the organism in power was patriarchal, there will therefore be a greater number of places with names of male gods, indicating areas of their cults towards those same male gods. But in more rural areas, areas further from the centers of power, uh, the, this is where we find more evidence of the presence of the cult of goddesses. Contexts mostly of farms, farmsteads, right? It is also in these spaces that folklore persists, that, that contains more evidences of female deities, such, such as in uh, names of plants, for example, or evocation of goddesses and other female spirits at the time of childbirth, evocation of goddesses for protection, for the fertility of women. In the issue of childbirth and women's fertility, uh, unfortunately, uh, it is still within a patriarchal, somewhat within a patriarchal and military social panorama, still. Uh, as we are talking about the factor of women giving birth to male children and the focus was not so much on daughters. This is also one of the reasons why the goddess Freya is also related to war, 
the combination of war and fertility giving birth to future warriors. It is, of course, uh, a sad and rather heavy, bleak prospect, but it was the reality of the mentality of that time within that society. This is even uh, well reflected on gender issues and in the economy linked to gender and gender roles. Literally, uh, most of the food production went to man, right? To be better fed for war. But those are questions for another time. But uh, it, it's actually something to reflect upon, which really shows how deeply rooted in our collective so uh, social mentalities a patriarchal perspective really is. And uh, these forms of thought have been dragged into our days. So if these post mentalities seem unjust and unfit for today's standards, why on earth we keep having these same attitudes and similar behavioral patterns? But then, in addition to these evidences of place names and some attitudes in folklore in which we see that the goddesses were really worshipped and rituals certainly existed towards these goddesses, but in spaces further away from uh, centers of power, we also have evidences in some female graves, female burials, uh, which also show us traces of a religious importance focused on the goddesses. Mostly talking about women's graves, for instance, where cats, the animal, uh, are found as a sacrificed animal and to be taken to the afterlife of that woman buried there. Cats are sacred animals related to the goddesses, the divine feminine. A wonderful archaeological find shows us precisely this connection between cats, women, and the cult of goddesses. Cats carved on the processional wagon from the Osberg ship burial, as an example. So we are here talking about an object with a wonderful craftsmanship in woodworking, purposely made to be an offering and to be taken to the other world, to the afterlife. An object dedicated to the goddesses, the feminine. The feminine in the afterlife as well. Well, as already said, unfortunately, uh, there is no evidence of rites, rituals, either for Frig, Friga or for Freya. Unfortunately, it is not possible to find anything within that field. Rituals that can appear today in relation to these goddesses are modern things, adaptations to the realities that we have today, joining with evidences of other completely different cultural contexts. Again, I don't think this is a bad thing. Just to point out that the real knowledge we have about these historical cultural contexts so far is one thing, and what we have nowadays in modern religious and spiritual expressions is another. <laughs> but there are some elements, uh, for example, with regard to the cult of the Disir, <laughs> which are female entities linked to ancestors and destiny. Difficult to determine when this type of cult actually appears, but certainly ancestor worship is something progressive that has come to exist in various societies over time. But here, at the end of the Scandinavian Iron Age, we realized that there was a specific cult to female entities, be they goddesses, ancestral women, and even female or feminine spirits linked to destiny. This appears to us, of course, in literary sources that point to the existence of the cult of the Disir, mainly in the Herverar saga, or Heidrek, uh, the saga of uh, Hervor and Heidrek, and in the Inglinga saga. There we can see elements linked to these cults. We are therefore talking about the celebration of Tistablot, the sacrifice to the Disir, the king riding a white horse and circling the temple. And this right here is already evidence of the cult, a performance, a specific act that was done in that cult to these female entities. Really, due to the lack of evidences of rituals to the goddesses, mainly here speaking in the context of Freya and Frigg, what we have nowadays in, uh, nowadays in neo-pagan rituals or off concerning neo-pagan rituals to these goddesses are creations of the very people who worship these goddesses in their own ways nowadays. And I think this is quite beautiful and I like to see this freedom of expression of human 
creativity and imagination. Therefore, it is just an academic matter of differentiating what is really the historical truth from what is being produced in modern times, just for academic reasons. That's all. Uh, at the end of the day, for those who worship the goddesses, it always ends up being something very personal, personified. This video is really just to get a sense of the historical reality and the evidences that we really have left of this historical past to avoid some common misconceptions. Therefore, when we do a ritual nowadays towards Freya or Frigg, it is not convenient to say that it was done like this and that's why I continue to do it the way it was done, but rather I do it like this, it's my personal expression. Because really, with the lack of evidence, we make do. And I'm sorry if this video is a little bit off-putting, but uh, there really isn't any concrete evidences left of rituals and cults, how things were actually done or conducted. But at least we have the perception that in some places the goddesses were actually worshipped. There was a cult of goddesses. This is important to say because, precisely because of the lack of evidences of goddesses or of, the, of goddess worship and religious performance towards the goddesses, rites and rituals, many authors claim that the goddesses were not and never were worshipped, to the point of even questioning the existence of goddesses. This is not true. We clearly understand that there were places where the worship of goddesses was important. So some form of religious and spiritual expression existed focuses, focused on goddesses. We have evidences that the vast majority of goddesses or of goddess worship was on farms in more rural areas where people depended a lot on the cycles of nature and the seasonal cycles, on the issue of fertility and abundance. Uh, they depended a lot on these aspects to survive. Depending on the, the cycles of planting, germination, when to plant, when to store, when to harvest, when to fish, when to hunt, taking into account cycles and even climatic changes and the, the weather itself, etc. The goddesses were closely linked to these aspects, but also to the births, whether of human or animals. We have to remember that. The, that the, the, the aspect of fertility and death are also very present in these goddesses, taking into account that the moment of childbirth can either give life or death, or even, the, the, or, or even to bring forth a life, another one has to go. Many women died in the process of childbirth. Many children died in childbirth or still in the womb. So it is a life's event with a great emotional impact in which the goddesses must also be present in this struggle for life. This is also linked to the Dísir, uh, in terms of the female entities that control destiny, who dies, who lives, moments of life that are in the hands of the goddesses. And of course, taking these aspects into account, we must also understand that if the goddesses were present in those moments, they would also be present in the groups, in the communities, in, the, in, in women's societies, in women's groups. For example, uh, let's not forget that the women of the Viking Age, one of their major important roles in the economy of that time and society was precisely to do with weaving, spinning and weaving. It is therefore not surprising that the Norse goddesses of that time were also closely linked to weaving, spinning the threads of destiny, even the weaving of fate. The women of a community who often joined alone, but together, no man, <laughs> just women, in the process of weaving clothes, the sails for boats, weaving tapestries where religious and mythological scenes often appear in the great halls, etc. Spinning and weaving, and weaving was a, an arduous, tedious process. It took a long time to make a piece of cloth, and it was an extremely important work, not just economically 
speaking, but you really need it to have clothing to protect yourself from the elements. So this is also linked to the goddesses. The fields of plants from which fiber is acquired to make all sorts of materials. You need the fertility of these soils, of the plants, and the, the process of making fiber, and the process of weaving it into a piece of cloth. You do need these plants to grow well and in abundance if you want the primary materials to make clothing. So it is in the hands of the goddesses and their power over fate, over fertility, and the very process of weaving and transforming raw material into an important object. So the goddesses were present and were important and certainly, certainly people had specific cults and rituals towards, towards them as well, towards the, the goddesses. My dear friends, I hope this video was useful. Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. And as always, thanks for today. Obrigado por hoje. Until we meet again, my dear friends.